Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now, it's often said that good things can come in very small packages and in the game I'm going to show you today that is quite literally true. I have owned this gem since about 2013, give or take, and I have never stopped playing it. Uh, it, it does have its quiet moments but it, um, it, it has been a fairly constant companion for me as well. And the game I'm referring to specifically is a Japanese design. I won't be surprised if most of you have never heard of this game. It was a bit of a chance discovery for me. And it is called, now please don't laugh because something is a bit lost in translation with this one, Iron Bottom and Sunset Sky. Uh, now the Pacific War uh, aficionados will of course recognise the... Um, reference to the Guadalcanal campaign, Iron Bottom Sound and Sunset Sky, of course, referring to the the, the beginning of the end for the Japanese Empire. You know, the, people talk a lot about the Battle of Midway and the catastrophic effect it had on the on the Japanese carrier forces. And that's very true. The ships they lost at Midway were absolutely irreplaceable. But the real strength of the Japanese Navy, uh, certainly in, in the air, I mean, they're precious pilots. Most of those survived midway. Most of them got home. It was the grinding, hideous battles of attrition in the Solomon Islands that saw the last of Japan's excellent pre-war pilots ground down. And, and the experience for the United States primarily in that campaign, bloody though it was, um, began this process by which they gained a dominance over the Imperial Navy, which they never lost. It was an initiative that they pretty much held for the remainder of the war in the Pacific. So this game, um, a Japanese magazine game, um, treats entirely uh, with that campaign. But it, it's, it's an absolute gem. So I realise I've only um, reviewed one other magazine game on this channel before. And um, that experience was not a happy one. Uh, you might remember that was um, the Malaya, uh, um, Pacific Battles Malaya. Uh, um, this one is an example of a magazine game done right, and it's splendid. Now, the first thing to tell you about it is that it's not a board game. It's a card game. If I flick the magazine to its reverse and show you, you have the... This, gorgeous set of wonderfully produced cards and you'll see what I mean by small in a minute because the these are not big but I'll linger on the magazine first because not only does it give you a wonderfully you know compact rule book not many pa 16 pages altogether including examples of play charts and tables you know I'm sorry let me do let me do this sensibly and flick through that now, there's only one critical thing that is problematic about this game. See, look at look at that. That really handy, handy player aid. Everything you need to know on the back. But the critical problem is, if you're anything like me, when it comes to languages, I do not have very much Japanese at all. In fact, it would be most accurate, really, to say that I have no Japanese whatsoever. And that is the problem. Iron Bottom and Sunset Sky has never seen daylight uh, in English and I really wish that a Western games company would pick this up. Um, it's been done before. There are quite a lot of Japanese games that have reappeared in um, English and it would be doing the wargaming community, particularly those who love the Pacific War, if this entire publication appeared in English. Now I'm going to do my usual and go on to enthuse about the game components, but the reason I say the entire publication is because in addition to that snazzy little rule book you get, the vast majority of this magazine is given over to the most wonderful detailed examples of play, um, covers just about every situation you can get. There's a brilliant historical background um, to the campaign where they give you a, a detailed write-up on every single type of aircraft included in the game. And not just that, you also get a bit of history on the ships too. And this is great. This, this whole thing is a, is a real, real gem. Look, more examples of play, hints on strategy and tactics, the designer's notes. 
um, even a rather entertaining little comic strip illustrating the playing out of the game with uh, angry admirals and uh, uh, um, other people. It's it's very uh, it's very amusing. I get the impression the U.S. doesn't do very well in this one, and and that could lead to some, you know, snide accusations that this is Japanese propaganda. But it's not really. Um, one thing that strikes me about this game is its balance. I've played this so many times, once or twice, because card games and games involving dice are quite swingy. You get one side getting an early advantage, followed by a swift victory, but that does not happen every time. Most of the time, this game gives you the grinding slog of the Solomons and those nail-biting moments when your forces are, you know, are breaking everywhere, and you feel that the other side, they're going to overwhelm you, but you don't realise that the other player sitting opposite you is sweating buckets just as much as you are, wondering how the heck your forces can take it, whereas his are that close to cracking. It's, it's an amazing achievement, this game. As you can see, the, from more examples of play, the action can get pretty, pretty crowded. Um, not as chaotic as it looks, though. Everything is pretty well thought out and very well explained. Um, so yes, aside from some other articles, again, my total lack of Japanese present, prevents me from appreciating them. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, so enough about the rule book come magazine. Let's see what this prettiness looks like. So all the cards are backed by this rather gorgeous card art. And it's very clear what everything is. Each player gets cards for two decks. There's the allied plane deck. The Allied Fleet Deck, and of course their Japanese counterparts. So, you know, that, that's fairly straightforward. Each player commences the game with a home base, Truck Lagoon for the Japanese, and Espiritu Santo for the Americans, or I should say allies, really. Now, you see these tiny cards, you see what I mean about small. This is really, really pretty tiny. I'm sorry my camera's not focusing very well. I'm gonna see if I can give it something to chew on without... No, it's not gonna do it. Hopefully you can see most of the numbers here because I'll just quickly explain what everything means. These aircraft icons are a base, uh, a base's aircraft capacity. So Espiritu Santo can accommodate two land-based planes one float plane, and one flying boat. This number is the anti-aircraft rating. Two is about as formidable as it gets in this game. That's your starting hand of aircraft cards. That's your starting fleet in terms of points, hand limit, how many cards you draw a turn, how many cards you get to keep, or if you, you could keep all three cards, but you skip your turn. If you want to actually perform actions on a turn, um, you have to choose two cards to keep and discard the third one. It's a lovely mechanic that recreates the bottleneck of supply and logistics that both sides encountered in the Solomons. And if I fetch the um, Truck Lagoon card back, you can see the Japanese have it slightly worse than the United States. They draw two cards, but if they want to perform a turn with usual actions, they only get to have the one. Um, and that's repair points. Inevitably in this game, units, particularly naval units, uh, will get damaged. So the US has a slightly better repair capacity than the Japanese. Um, just to give you an example of a normal base card, because the stats are slightly different, your home base is, cannot actually be invaded within the context of this game. It pretty much covers the Solomon's campaign up to the first month or two of 1943. So... There is no way the Americans are getting up to truck. And to be perfectly honest, even if they had taken Guadalcanal, I suspect the Japanese would have struggled to reach Espiritu Santo. So I think that's fair enough. The next major logistical bases, uh, both players start with their home bases, but they also have these major logistical bases. Now that impressive beast up here is Rabaul, uh, and that is Port Moresby. So where the stats differ, I'll stick with, I'll stick with Rabaul for the purposes of this example. Um, you remember that's anti-aircraft. 
that is shore-based defences. So if if the if the Allies attempt to land at Rabaul, and good luck to be honest, it's a tough cookie. Think of those as coastal defence guns. That represents mines and motor torpedo boats. That's its intrinsic garrison. That is the base's reconnaissance ability. If at the beginning of a turn the Allied player declares that he's going to invade Rabaul, again, good luck, that's the reference number the Japanese use for seeing if the local patrols pick up the incoming fleet. And that is the base's defensive strength. Um, whether you're bombing it, bombarding it, um, or doing both in combination with landing troops, that's the target number in terms of damage you have to achieve to put the base out of commission. So quite simple, quite straightforward. Um, you can see on, let's pick a US card this time. I'm going to pick on the South Dakota class battleships. The numbers are pretty much directly transferable from one unit to the other. So it's obvious that, you know, anti-aircraft, heavy gun battery, torpedoes. The green shaded number is its ground bombardment capability. That's how many victory points it's worth. That is the anti-submarine rating, which of course on a battleship you wouldn't expect to be much. Um, that is its speed rating. Uh, not an actual statement of its speed, but how easily it can disengage from a surface combat. And this is pretty clever because this ship's been given a low number because it represents, even though you're playing at a grand strategic level, it represents the unwillingness of a commander in charge of a really powerful unit to, to disengage. So, you know, if you're a battleship and you're about to engage in a night action, OK, it's the Japanese you're going up against, and OK, it's a night action, but you're a modern US warship with good radar and a respectable gun battery. You're not going to run from this fight. You're also pretty tough. Um, compared to the Congo-class battleships, these things are monsters. It's only if the Japanese get the Yamato on board, then, then you start freaking out a bit. Uh, and lastly, there's the aircraft cards, which, again, same gorgeous artwork. Now, people who just love the ships and planes of the Pacific War will adore this game, even if they don't have the faintest idea how to play it, because these are so nice. That artwork is so good. So, again, anti-aircraft rating, that, that in, is, is the passive rating. So you notice the zero has split figures. So if it is on a bombing mission, um, or if it is an escort role, it reacts to attacks using the weaker number. If it's on a fighter sweep or air superiority mission, it uses the much stronger number. But otherwise, the statistics are comparable again. So dive bombing rating or, or, lev or tactical level bombing. So the Kate is all right at that. The Zero has no capacity there. That, that's level bombing against ships, by the way. The middle figure is torpedo bombing, so again the zero gets zip. Kate is much more respectable. And again, green shaded, attacks versus ground targets. That shows the aircraft type. The zero and the Kate are both all, can function as either land planes or fleet aircraft and land on carriers. The zero is terrible at reconnaissance, the Kate is not much better. And that number in the bottom corner, the three, is their range. Now, the range is under, underlined, so what that means is if they take off from a land base, their outgoing range is somewhat reduced. If they take off from a carrier, they can fly at their full uh, range. So that can be an important characteristic when you're deploying your planes. So that's the pretty bit. Um, how do you win the game? Well, essentially, the game ends when any one of the four decks, either player's fleet or um, aircraft deck, runs out of cards, at which point you count your victory points. Um, the victory points are up there for bases, and as we saw, there for ships. Bases are worth double points if they're destroyed. Aircraft are worth no points, which does encourage you to fling large numbers of them into battle because at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're not penalising yourself if you lose them. But what you are seeing is a degradation in your combat capability. But sometimes it's worth the risk. 
Um, there is an exception in that if players are tied at the end of the game, if the US has the all-important island of Guadalcanal in play and it is still active, then they win the game. If the Japanese have been able to eliminate it or if it never entered play in the first place, then the Japanese win. So that's an important one to bear in mind. So it is possible in this game for you to suffer disproportionate disadvantageous losses um, to your air and naval strength. But as the campaign did, it all revolves around possession of this critical island. And I have seen games where the Americans have taken a terrible drubbing, but they have managed to play Guadalcanal and they have hurt the Japanese badly enough that the Japanese have lacked the strength to reduce the island. It's, it, it's been incredible to watch. So the Japanese will say, for example, win their cherished decisive battle, sink a couple of US carriers, but they'll usually lose one of their own in return and a lot of their air assets. And then with what they have left, they try these desperate attempts to seize Guadalcanal. They never quite make it. And it goes right down to the wire. And that, that's what so much of this game is about. So. Each turn, a player will go through a series of actions. They deploy their ships, they deploy their aircraft. Um, range is calculated by where your fleet, where the ships of your fleet are, um, either in the main body and outer screen or in reserve. Aircraft can be assigned to bases or carriers. Um, the, the geography is somewhat abstracted, so your bases are deployed in either your rear line, as is the case with a home base like Espiritu Santo, or they are in your middle or outer line, as per Rabaul, or you have these guys, the little other bases that pop up over the course of play. Now this particular one is Lae, and this would be in the Japanese outer defense screen. Significantly, you can only move on an enemy base if you if you crack the outer defense screen, then you can begin moving on bases in the center. And lastly, you can, if you want, bomb the enemy's home base, but you can't ever invade them. You can only reduce their stats through bombing raids. So that is this game in a nutshell. I am going to set up uh, a sample game and play it to show you how it works properly. But if you ever get a chance to get this, I'm afraid it's a hard game to find these days, but if you can find it, even secondhand, it is really worth it. I've had so much fun out of this game. I'm really looking forward to demoing it for you. And I must offer a big shout out to the designer, um, Mr. Tomoki Kondo. He is a gentleman of the first order. When I got the game, I struggled as much as I could and with the, with, the, with the help of both Google Translate, you can see my scrawl all over this, and a very kind Japanese colleague at my workplace who put up with me badgering her with photocopies of cards and, you know, saying, what, what does this mean? Can you, can you possibly tell me? And she very kindly sat down, waded through what she admitted to me later was really unfamiliar military technology. Some, some, of, some of this is not what most a lot of Japanese use in their everyday conversation. And fair enough, if you're not interested in military history, why would you? But she did her best and she really helped me out. But, but the really great thing was I posted a question about whether the rules were in English anywhere. And within a day, um, Tomoki Kondo responded by posting the rules in English. They are on this game's page on Board Game Geek. Now, just a bit of a health warning. You'll, you'll need the game in front of you because um, while, while Tomoki Kondo's English is infinitely superior to my Japanese, it's, it's tricky to wade through. It, 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 you, you can tell he's put he, he's written his rules and then he's tried to get them into a foreign language. So all credit to him for doing that. But it's it's much handier if you can actually see what he's talking about when you go through and learn the rules. So hopefully my video will help clear up any questions among those of you who have got this game and are still struggling with it. But I really just want to show you what an amazing, amazing game it is. 
and why I think that it would do so well if it was translated to English and released into the Western market. I look forward to doing that for you all soon. But in the meantime, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I will see you again fairly shortly. Uh, thank you as always for your company and for tuning into the channel. And um, let's go do Iron Bottom Sunset Sky sometime. No, that's not a euphemism for anything. Thank you.